Hello everyone, how are you folks doing today? My name is Armando, and in this video, now, we're going to be talking about the Massey murders. Now, there's always, uh, you know, people say, oh, the, the local people here are anti-Holly or against uh, people from the mainland or whatever. But, you know, this, if you understood what happened, and this was back in 1931, a long time ago. You understood what happened at that time. There's a lot of racial prejudice going on. And, you know, that carried on over years and years. And so the sentiment against mainlanders or, or so called Hollies, let's say, you know, that has, that was carried on for many, many years. So, anyway, let's get started. What are the Massey murders? Well, uh, there was a trial, Massey trial, for what was known as the Massey Affair. It was a 1932 criminal trial that took place in Honolulu, Hawaii, territory. Now, socialite Grace Fortescue, along with several accomplices, was charged with the murder of the well-known prize fighter Joseph Kahahai. Fortescue was the mother of Thalia um, Massey, uh, who brought charges that Kahal Hawaii was one of a group of men who had raped her. So let me, before I get into the story, let me give you a, a little bit of background of the Macy family and of the police at that time. Um, now, the Macy family, Grace Hubbard Fortescue Maiden name is Grace Hubbard Bell. She's the granddaughter of Gardiner Green Hubbard, the first president of the National Geographic Society. Her father, Charles James Bell, was the first cousin of inventor Alexander Graham Bell. Her marriage to Major Roland Granville Fortescue, an out of wedlock son of Robert Barnwell Rose. Not leave her as financially successful as she would have wished. But she nevertheless kept up appearances and raised her daughter, Thalia, with an upper American class lifestyle. But she wasn't getting too much money at that time. Now, Grace Thalia Fortescue, daughter, married Lieutenant Thomas Massey a rising United States Navy officer. Now, in 1930, Massey arrived at Pearl Harbor. Rathalia considered herself, quote, unquote, above the rest of the officer's wives and soon became an outcast. Marriage apparently uh, was not very, was terribly not successful at the, to start with degenerated um, into heavy drinking and public fights. Uh, Thalia has had a second miscarriage shortly prior to the incident and was on quote unquote probation with her husband who wrote an informal set of conditions under which she would continue the marriage. So their marriage is not that good the time. Now, talking about the Honolulu police, I'm just giving you a background now, the Honolulu police. In 1931, the Honolulu police force uh, was bitterly split between two factions. Uh, the McIntosh faction, led by Captain Nelson McIntosh, uh, which consisted mostly of white officers, and the Howell faction, led by Deputy Sheriff David Howe, which consisted mostly of police officers of a Hawaiian heritage. Both factions had political backing. McIntosh was a choice of Hawaii's business elite, while Howe had the backing of still politically powerful Hawaiian royalty. So, 
two factions against each other. Macintosh was regarded as a racist by indigenous Hawaiians, while Hao's faction was considered corrupt by Mike Macintosh's faction. Patrick K. Gleason, the sheriff of Honolulu, tried to keep peace within his department as he needed the votes of both factions to win re-election. So, things got pretty heated in August 1931 when Hall was forced in re into retirement. While the retirement itself was not finalized, McIntosh temporarily took over his position with all of the detectives formally reporting to him. However, as McIntosh was hostile to detectives from Hall's faction, Sheriff Gleason would give um, some of them direct assignments, thus retaining the parallel command uh, structure. Now, so that's pretty much the background. You can see there's two factions of the police department, and just give you a background of Dalia uh, Massey, husband, not marriage is on shaky ground. So let's get to the events of what actually happened on September. Well, the 13th of 1931. So, in the evening hour of Saturday, September 12th, 1931, the Masseys, the Browns, and the Bransons, they're all Navy couples, attended a Navy event at the LOI Inn, a Waikiki nightclub. At about 11.30 p.m., Dahlia had an argument with a Lieutenant Stogsdall which ended up uh, with her slapping an officer and storming out. So, Thomas, not having witnessed, he didn't witness the event, assumed she was tired and gone home and stayed at the nightclub. Meanwhile, at some time between 11.30 and 12, Dahlia left the LOI Inn. She claimed to have walked towards um, Waikiki Park, a dance hall a few hundred meters from the nightclub, which had a dance that night as well. The dance was normally scheduled to end at 11.45, but ended closer to 11.55 that night. Now, it said sometime between 12.20 and 12.45 Sunday morning, Dahlia was picked up by a car driving along Ala Moana Road then a relatively isolated road that connected Waikiki to Honolulu, which is often used as a lover's lane by locals. Now, the car was occupied by the Beringer and Clark families, who were the first to definitely wreck Thalia after she left LOI Inn. Okay, so according to their testimony, uh, Thalia claimed that she was assaulted and robbed but not raped by several Hawaiian men. She declined police intervention and asked to be taken home. She got there at about 1 a.m. However, the driver made several mistakes while driving there, so it was not the shortest route. As Thomas was still not home, she did not have the keys. But Dahlia had to break uh, through the back door to get inside the house. So the last thing I said, LOI Inn was su supposed to stop at midnight. However, the patrons did not let the orchestra stop until 1 a.m. So, at that time, Thomas tried to look for his wife uh, once, once more. He but gave up and went for an after party at Rigby's home where the Navy officers were supposed to meet after the evening. He was accompanied by Lieutenant Branson. His wife left with their car. However, there was no party at Rigby, so Branson fell asleep there. And Thomas went for some late snacks. Thomas tried to call his wife to make sure she had arrived safely. After several calls, she finally answered. She 
He told Thomas to come home immediately if something terrible had happened to her. Uh, Thomas took the car and left, leaving the sleeping Branson behind. So he's heading home at this point in time. As Thomas arrived home, uh, Thalia told him about the assault. Over her objections, Thomas immediately phoned the police who arrived to take her statement. Initially, she could not provide any details at all, uh, stating that and it was too dark to identify any of the men or to see any details of the car they emerged from. So this is important. This is her first story now. It's too dark. She can't see anything in the car, the details of the car. That's story number one from her. However, Thalia changed her story several hours later. She changes it. Not only describing the assailants as locals, but giving police a license number. Wow, how did she get that license number now? Within hours, a police arrested a Japanese American man named Horace Ida. Ida was not entirely surprised at first, as only a few hours earlier, he had been in involved in a near collision while driving his sister's car with several friends, including Kahahabai and Ahakuelo. Although there was no damage, an argument broke out with the couple driving the other car, which culminated in Kahahabai slugging the woman. Upon his... Uh, Arrival at the police station, I don't know, Ida, Horace Ida, sorry, Horace Ida. Arriving at the police station, the charge with the altercation was never brought up. Instead, he found to his dismay that he was being charged with rape. Okay, so, now, at first glance, the story seemed to be credible. Thalia's license plate was off by only one digit per letter, and her description of the man, Ida, and his friends were fairly accurate. However, it would later became known that the police taking Thalia's statement had in fact told her both pieces of information. Apparently, after hearing the name and description, and the initial complaint filed by the woman driver. Attorney Charles Riccio, a legal advisor with the Colorado State P Patrol, offers the following account of the incident involving Horace Edom. Now, this is the story about the, the accident of Horace Edom and, 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 and the other couple. Now, Horace Edom, a young Japanese man, had borrowed his sister's a two-year-old car and attended a, a luau accompanied by his pals to Kahavai, Benny Ahakuelo, David Takai, and Henry Chang. At about 12.30 a.m., Horace suggested they call it a night. He and his friends piled into the car and left the luau. Now, as the car passed through the intersection, downtown Honolulu, Horace barely missed colliding with an automobile coming from the opposite direction. There was no contact between the two cars. The boat drivers stopped and everyone piled out to argue the fine points of Hawaiian motor vehicles. So, that's what happened. The occupants of the other car were Mr. and Mrs. People. Mrs. People was voicing her opinion of Horace Eda's driving skills. And Big Joe Kahavai, all six feet and more of him, hauled off and punched her in the face. Mrs. Peoples was equal to the challenge she gave as good as she got. He cleansed her fist, wound up, and Big Joe, surprised, slugged him in the mouth. She wasn't going to take it from him. The incident was about to become a Donny Brook. However, a cooler heads prevailed, and the people drove off to the police station to report the incident. Now, 
at the station, the People's Gay Warriors Eagles license plate as 58-895. And the police put out an all points bulletin for the car and its occupants. At about the same time, the police learned of the in Alamoana Park. Of the, and so it was only natural that they would assume Uh, that the occupants of the Ida uh, car were more than likely the perpetrators of the assault of Thalia Massa. Now, so they tried to connect the two incidents. Aris Ida and his friends were eventually located through the car's license plate and were brought before Thalia at the police station. She was unable to identify Horace Ida who was wearing a brown leather jacket when she saw him. Now, when asked the license number of the assailant's car, she did not remember it, but later heard the plate number 58-895 being broadcast at the police station. <coughs> so, she heard it at the police station. The next day, under further questioning, Thalia's story began to change. It's not changing again. She now remembered that one of her assailant's car was 58805. Uh, okay? So, only one digit was different from the number of Horace Eda's plate. Now, to the police, the case against Horace Eda and his friends began to look stronger. Five men insisted they were not part of any you know, assault on a, on a white woman walking through the darkness of John Eno. They explained their movements on the night at length, but the police were not persuaded. The five young men were indicted in charge of the rape and assault. Now, Rear Admiral uh, Yates Sterling Jr., a commandant of the U.S. Navy's 14th Naval District 9, which included the Hawaiian Islands. I heard he, he was a racist person too. Indicated that his first inclination was to lynch the accused assailants, but that they must give well, the authorities a chance to carry out the law and not interfere. As the case developed, cracks in Thalia's story immediately appeared. In, a, in order to have assaulted Thalia, an event so far unproven to have even occurred, it would have been extremely difficult to have them been involved in the near accident across town. And so the police um, themselves were split on the case. Many of the detectives were locals. So the case was a sham, and when they were denied access to the courtroom, started to talk directly to the press. So that's why I, I was bringing up the about the difference in the police split faction. While the you know, while the good citizens of Honolulu waited for the trial to begin, rumors began to develop and spread throughout the city. So here comes the rumors. There were those who whispered that Dali had not been raped at all. It was said that she was having an illicit relationship with one of the five Beach Boy suspects. And that she was on her way to a rendezvous with him when she found him in the company of four drunken friends. Now this is just a rumor, okay? So it was also speculated that Dali was having an affair with one of Tommy's shipmates. So when Tommy came home after the party, as the gossip went, he found her, he found his friend in the act with his wife, and it was Tommy who beat up his wife and broke her jaw. So those are just rumors. Grace Fortescue, enraged by the stories, and what she saw as an attempt to sully the name of her daughter and the family started a public com campaign to attack the defendants. However, the case quickly fell apart in court. Now, 
After a three-week trial and lengthy jury deliberation, the jurors declared themselves deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. So it ended up in a mistrial. Now, you know, talking about Grace Fortescue was not willing, she wasn't willing to wait for another trial. So what, what did she do? She first arranged for the kidnapping and vicious beating of Ida. Then talked Thomas into kidnapping Kahahabai, the darkest skin of the five defendants, with the help of two Navy enlisted men, Albert O. Jones and Edward J. Lord. Now Kahabai underwent interrogation as Grace, Thomas, and two Navy men attempted to beat a confession out of him. Eventually, one of the group of four shot Kahawai. So he was killed. Debating what to do, the group eventually decided to dump Kahawai's body off Coco Hill, at the time a desolate area far away from urban Honolulu. Although he would eventually be found, it seemed to them unlikely that anyone would even care. They wrapped Kahawai in a sheet and put him in Fort Excuse's rented car, pulling down the so they pulled down the shades of the car. So he was in the back seat to pull the shades down to hide the interior. But however, a police motorcyclist alerted to the kidnapping saw the blinds and considered it suspicious. He pulled him over, discovered Kahawai's body, and immediately arrested all four on suspicion of murder. Now, so, we all were charged for murder. Now, Clarence Darrell decided to take on the group's defense for the sum of $30,000. That was a lot of money back in those days. This is 1932. Now, Clarence Darrell, um, he, this is during the Depression. He lost everything. You know, he was, he was poor, and, he, and but he, so he came out of retirement. But, you know, there was two reasons why he took the case. Not one, number one was the money, of course, and number two was he never seen Hawaii, so he wanted to go to Hawaii. So, Clarence Darrell, and he was very, uh, very famous in the mainland. He was brought out of retirement by Eva Stutisbury, an old family friend and wife of Edward Stutisbury. Throughout the trial, Thalia presented herself as an innocent victim. The prosecutor, John Kelly, played on her feeling of superiority. She became enraged, ripped up a piece of evidence, and stormed from the stand. Although this would seem to be a prosecution victory, the court erupted in supportive applause from the spectators. Now, the jury returned a verdict of manslaughter rather than murder. Okay? Racial tensions were so high that everyone expected another hung jury. Now, the mainland express Sorry, the mainland press exploded with even more stories, and the situation in Hawaii grew more tense. Martial law was considered uh, by Admiral Sterling if rioting were to be used, as he had considered imposing it from the start. Now, there was also, I read about um, Randolph Hearst, remember, uh, he was. Uh, on the newspaper, and he, was, he, he made a comment like, well, we should send a battleship over there to rescue them. I mean, those are kinds of comments. It's ridiculous. But uh, the tension, the anti-Hawaiian sentiment in the main was very high at that time. You know, so it's, it, it, was really, it was really bad back then. Okay, so anyway. After a flurry of di diplomatic maneuvering between Washington, D.C. and Honolulu, martial law was avoided. Instead, under pressure from the Navy, Territorial Governor Lawrence M. Judd commuted the 
10 year sentences of the convicted killers in one hour to be served in his office. So they went to his office and they had tea with him. One hour. That's their sentence. Uh, so they were supposed to be it's a 10 year sentence. They were supposed to go to jail for 10 years. Wow, can you imagine how other people felt? And the anti, like I said, anti holy sentiment back then. Days later, the entire group, including the Massings, the two other Navy men, Fortescue and Darrell, uh, boarded a ship and left the island in turmoil. Dahlia and Massey divorced in 1934. So, uh, two years later, they divorced. She committed suicide in 1962. He died in 1987. I heard he had some problems and was released from the Navy. And I don't have all the details, but I heard he had some issues. But anyway, Grace Hubbard Fortescue died in 1979 and is buried in Arlington National. So Grace Fortescue, what I heard is that she inherited you know, a lot. She lived a uh, you know, a long life, but she inherited a lot of money. Inheritance. Uh, Albert Jones died on September 23rd, 1966. Edward Lord died in 1967. Now, in 1966, while being interviewed by author Peter Van Slingerland, Albert O. Jones admitted that he was the one who shot Joseph Kahala. Now, there was something called Pinkerton Investigation of the Ala Moana Keys. So let's talk a little bit about that. Although the uh, prosecution's lead witness, Dahlia Massey, had left the territory and could not be forced to return to testify, the four surviving Ala Moana defendants could not be exonerated or convicted. As Peter Van Slingland wrote, Congress, the Navy, and the mainland public opinion would not allow the charges to be dropped without good reason. Before the subsequent dismissal of the charges, Governor Judd hired the Pinkerton's National Detective Agency to further investigate and review the evidence. The Pinkerton Agency responded with a 279-page report in which the introductory letter stated, an analysis of the reports of our representative together with the reports and statements of the Attorney General's office, the Office of the Public Prosecutor and the Police Department, also the testimony at the trial of the defendant, makes it impossible to escape the conviction that the kidnapping and assault was not caused by those accused with the attendant circumstances alleged by Mrs. Matthew. However, because of the victim's departure and the uncertainty of the time context, it became impossible to ever truly determine the actual guilt or innocence of the, of the defendant. So that's a long story, but anyway, this Massey murders uh, of 1931 was, you know, can you imagine they were they got away with murder, you know? Grace Fortescue got away with the, you know, all of them got away with murder of Joe Kahalabai, you know, he was killed. An innocent man was murdered. And so he asked the question, well, why why do people hate Hollywood? Why do people hate the mainland? Well, I think, um, I think it's a good reason why. Today it's a lot different. I mean, you don't have this kind of uh, open racism or, or, you know, they wouldn't know. I don't think the people here would allow that kind of crap to happen today. You know, it would be... People would protest like crazy. It's a lot different today, you know. Thank God. I'm glad we uh, 
Now, there's no, in Hawaii, there's no majority race. You know, we're all, this is a melting pot, and there's all different races in the world. There's no, there's no majority here. But in, at that time, as you can see by this trial and what happened, when the end result, these people got away with murder. And so can you imagine, put yourself in this, you know, during this time, you know? And can you imagine the sentiment and feeling of the people, the local people at that time? It was terrible. And the hate against Hollies, the white people at that time. That was, that was terrible. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this story. Mahalo for watching. And Ahoy Hope.